Just I'll greet you all with the uh, greetings of our holy prophets. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Which means, may the peace and blessings and mercy of God be upon you. Similarly, a Jewish person would say, Shalom Aleichum. You hear that? Shalom Aleichum and Assalamu Alaikum. Sounds very close, huh? So I've come here to represent first, before I speak from behalf of the Muslims, um, a dear friend of mine, Rabbi Judy Schindler and Rabbi Jonathan Freirich. Um, they're having their high holy day um, called uh, Sukkot right now. So they are in the middle of a program at the Temple Bethel. So she sent me with this message uh, for all of you. And it is a very um, powerful message that I think we can all appreciate looking where the world is going. From Rabbi Judy Schindler, Rabbi Jonathan Freirich, Cantor Andrew Bernard, and Cantor Mary Thomas, the clergy of Temple Bethel. We wish, you could, we wish we could be with you for the service of understanding and reconciliation. But tonight marks the first night of our holiday, holiday Sukkot. At this moment, our community is gathering to mark one of our most important festivals. In the midst of our holy time, our hearts and prayers for wholeness and holiness are also with all of you. On this holy day, which starts Sukkot, we go outside and dwell in fragile booths, which are called Sukkot in Hebrew. These booths are meant to move us to celebrate our fall harvest, remember our 40 years of wandering, celebrate the transition of nature and the fragility of our lives and the world. Of course, as we build our small shelters, we pray for God to be partners with us in building larger metaphoric sukkha in the world, a shelter of peace under which all humanity will celebrate the diversity of God's creation. To the Islamic community, as your brothers and sisters of faith, and as fellow sons and daughters of Abraham, we are united with you tonight in your call for an interfaith understanding. We who have been victims of anti-Semitism for centuries feel for you. We condemn the recent video desecrating Islam. We condemn Islamophobia in any and all of its forms. We who carry the names of those who were put to death in the Holocaust simply for being Jewish know what it is like to live in the world of hatred. We whose parents and grandparents were cast from their homes with their worldly belongings, security, safety, and lives they knew stolen from them. Know how words of hatred or despicable YouTube videos can lead to dehumanization and devastation. Negative stereotyping, hostility, discrimination, generalizing about a whole from a few, that is anti-Semitism. That is also Islamophobia. Racism, sexism, xenophobia, and all attempts to de dehumanize a child of God. For us as Jews, anti-Semitism's roots are firmly established in the anti-Judaism of the 4th century Roman Empire. The institutionalized discrimination against Jews of the early ages, the bloodshed of the Crusades, and the words used by Martin Luther to condemn our community in the 16th century. Pogroms against and mass murders of our people are sadly a part of our collective memory. The Holocaust is daily in the thoughts of so many of our minds as Jews. 11 million people, among them 6 million Jews, 1.5 million children are, were violently stolen from this world for no reason other than their identities. Anti-Semitism continues to this very day across the world. There are 613 commandments in the Torah. The Jewish philosopher Emil Fackenheim states that the Holocaust gave us, gave us a 614th commandment not to give Hitler a posthumous victory. With the responsibility comes the obligation to never give any purveyor of hate the form, the form to succeed in spreading their evil. The words never again that we use in response to the Holocaust of the Jews apply to all. It is a commandment to never again let hatred lead to violence. Never again is a commitment not only of words but of action. 
Never again is a moral mandate. Tonight we move forward, gathering hand in hand, speaking out in support of anyone who is the victim of discrimination, especially when their difference is not our own. Educating our community to embrace diversity and understand differences. These are the critical steps we must make. Pastor Nia Moller, the anti-Nazi theologian who was imprisoned in concentration camps for eight years as a result of his public stance, wrote in the following. First, they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the communists, and I didn't speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Tonight, may we seek to understand and may we commit to speak out against hatred and to act as partners with one another as people of faith to bring light, unity, and peace to our world. Amen. Amen. I can relate now very amazingly enough, being a middle-class white American raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I bet you can't imagine that me and my new wife, my innocent new wife of 18 years old, we went over the border in Detroit, Michigan to go to a conference called Reviving the Islamic Spirit, bringing a peaceful balance of spirituality to the masses of the Muslims. Some 20, 30,000 coming there. The idea is to promote the goodness of our faith. So when I went into Canada with my wife, they said, what are you here for? And we said, we're here for the Sky Dome, reviving the Islamic spirit uh, convention. They said, thank you very much. And we went in. On our way back, when we we're in these long lines. This is back in 2003. And when we got to the place, as a matter of fact, one of my scholars, one of my professors and teachers told me, in this occasion, it might be of benefit to you to stretch the truth. Because if harm will come your way, you might have that facilitation for yourself. I knew that I had been living the last three years of my life to rid myself of lying. And I know that I'm no good at lying anymore because I have accused myself every time I had the desire to lie. So when I got up there, they said, what were you doing in Canada? I said, I went to the Reviving the Islamic Spirit Convention. He wrote on this sticker, put it on my thing and said, pull over. At which I saw a few hundred Muslims all over there. Might as well just put a crescent with a star right here on us. Okay. So then they moved us in there and they came to my car, which I was a student at the Islamic American University at the time, and I have some books teaching me about Islam. And when they came for me, they took me and my wife outside, one gentleman and one woman that works for our government. And then, then they proceeded to harass us and accuse us of not being Americans. My wife began to cry. They told us, your buddies, your people blew up the World Trade Centers. Your brothers and sisters did that to the American people. Why would you come to this land? I said, you're holding my passport. He said, yeah, we know what you're really up to. If you study, you will find that even the FBI has been teaching anti-Islam, teaching that moderate Muslims are all part of some secret plot to take over the country with Sharia law. This isn't just Looney Tunes on the far right listening to Rush Limbaugh. These are people working for our government. Okay? It's getting like it was in Germany. Okay? We're all being accused for what some lunatics supposedly did on 9-11 of which our faith is completely against. I could go on and tell you a few more stories. I'm currently on the flying while Muslim harass list. I cannot print out a ticket from the internet. When I get there, I try to print out and it says, see the agent. The agent calls TSA, DHS, back and forth. 
And then they tell me, you can't have a ticket, we have to wait to clear you. And this has happened over and over and over to me. I've sent my letter to the government and they will do nothing for me. I am accused for being a Muslim who preaches Islam. They have, I asked them, do you have a case against me? As an American, you would assume there is a right to trial and just no. You're a Muslim, this is the list we put you on. There's thousands of us being put on that list. It is looking scarily like Germany started to look back in the 1930s and 40s. We need to be careful where we're going with this attitude. And we need to be careful the rhetoric that we reap. So, my own speech. Sorry, I may have gotten a little bit emotional there, but... I begin in the name of the one God, creator of the universe, who is primarily known as beneficent, merciful, kind, loving, compassionate, forgiving. I exalt his name. I ask him to send his peace and blessings and mercy upon all of his prophets. The most famous five that we know are Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Peace and blessings of God be upon them. I begin in this beautiful church that you have made here next to us. And I felt very bad because I talked to uh, Reverend Sarsala and, and I haven't had a chance to come by. And this is a failure from my behalf. I have made a mistake to my neighbor of which I am wrong in my own religious tradition. This place is called Our Lady of the Assumption. I want to read you something and then I want you to see your reaction because when the uh, Reverend read some verses of the Holy Bible and he said the word of the Lord and everybody says thanks be to God So I will read you a little bit from the Holy Quran <laughs> Which means I seek refuge with Almighty God from the accursed Satan Bismillahirrahmanirrahim <laughs> In the name of God, the gracious, the merciful. وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَاكِ وَطَهَّرَكِ وَطَهَّرَكِ وَاصْطَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ And when the angels came and they said to Mary, Indeed, God has chosen you and God has purified you and he has preferred you over the women of the world does that sound like the word of God I think so we have a lot that we have to share as a people we have a lot in common there is so much more in common you can't imagine it but we have to take that step to culture ourselves to see where we work together. As the Reverend mentioned, we have our dogmatic attachment to God and what we feel very comfortable in our understanding of divine reality and in salvation. And that's a personal thing for all of us between us and God. And we should have no problem being proud of that in this American context. But at the same time, we have a lot to do working for God together in so many verses that agree about what we're supposed to be do as stewards and ambassadors of the message of God. First, I want to read to you a fatwa. Ooh, the fatwa. Off with his head. Yeah. This is what most people understand the word fatwa to mean. Kill Sanman Rushdie. Right? This is what you've heard. There was a fatwa put against. The word fatwa means a legal edict given by a scholar of Islam. And according to our scholars, it is not considered revelation because we believe the revelation ended with the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him. But it is a scholar's interpretation of the law. And I think it's very common to the Canaans of our brothers and sisters in humanity from the Catholic tradition. You have legal edicts. So the union, the International Union of Muslim Scholars, which is one of the biggest organizations with representation from Egypt, from Qatar, from India, from Morocco, from all over the world, the greatest scholars that we have. 
in dealing with this recent event, this is what they had to say. First of all, this film could not ever harm or discredit our beloved Prophet, peace be upon him. This act was done by a small group to cause the masses to lose control of their emotions by insulting what they hold sacred. We call upon Muslims in America to seek any legal repercussions possible against this hateful slander. We urge all Muslim governments to take a positive educative role in response to this film. Finally, all Muslims must react to this event with good character and Islamic ethics, specifically not damaging property or resorting to violence and being just in that this film was produced by a small group and does not represent a whole country or their religion. Now that sounds very reasonable, doesn't it? How many of you have heard, why don't those Muslims condemn this and that and the other? I could sit here and read you a whole book of fatwas by all of our scholars about September 11th, about this, about that, but guess what? We do not have the money or the political clout in influencing the media to publish those things. We did not not condemn evil. Our religion teaches us before we even recite our holy book to seek refuge from the essence of evil, our enemy, Satan, and his allies. So obviously, you have to bear with us in understanding that as Imam Khalil said, we have to work our way through this system in order to attain our respect and our rights amongst our peers. But as people of faith, we know do not judge. It's a big commandment, lest ye be judged, right? And we do not want the judgment of God to fall upon us negatively. And we pray that God will preserve us all from that. So, Believe it or not, the Holy Qur'an is all about love and peace. The word Islam, it means to submit to the will of God in order to attain peace. I think the Father would correct me if I'm mistaken, but it was Jesus who was approached. And somebody came to him and said, Master, Master. And then he said, not everyone who comes to me saying, Master, Master, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. In another one he said, He who does the will of my father is my mother, my brother, and my sister. Confirming and teaching what we call Islam, to submit to the will of God. Moses, uh, Noah, they all said things like this. It's nothing unfamiliar to you. So I wanted to clarify before leaving a couple of verses of our Holy Qur'an which was intended when these scholars made this edict telling Muslims to act according to Islamic ethics. And then I want you to compare the Muslim, the one who said, I'm following Islam, right? The one who says, I'm a submitter to the will of God and the actual will of God that that person should be living. So, in one of it it says, إِدِفَعْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ Respond as a command to evil and foul character with that which is better. And then you will see that the one between you and him or her is enmity you will become close friends. Sound very familiar, right? There's another one in which he says, <laughs> Take the path of forgiveness and good character and turn your backs to the ignorant. And we're seeing these pictures of people flipping out and jumping over things. They don't understand their religion. They don't understand anything. Many people in the Muslim world, we have to look at their, look from their perspective. Uneducated, oppressed by a tyrannic dictator rule for a long time. Very upset about major, faulty, corrupt policies coming from our government towards their lands for decades and afflicting millions of people. They feel like they need to get this off their chest. And they're doing it with emotion, not with religion. And finally, says, وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْضَ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ 
The truly pious who will inherit paradise are those who control their anger and pardon people because truly God loves the righteous. Obviously, you see, and we could, and those of the people from my community could know, we could go on and on and on with these verses and hadiths and sayings of our beloved Prophet. The example of mercy and compassion and forgiveness, overlooking, forgiving and pardoning is central to God, His Messenger, and His Book and His Scripture. These are crux issues in our faith that are all over the place. Yes, as we have in the Holy Bible, there are rules of war engagement and there are certain particular dealing with setting and circumstances that should be understood in context, some rules about those who oppress you or invade you or whatever. Nobody can cherry pick that and cancel all of this out for whatever tyrannic intentions they want. But that's the problem when somebody did not learn and study with scholarship and just opened up a book that is very deep and started making their own decisions. You've all heard of the KKK, the white supremacists, the Nazis. They use biblical resource. I don't know if y'all remember Marshall Applewhite. You remember that one in San Francisco? The movement to bring many people, engineers and doctors, to come all kill themselves. Nineteen of them. And he had this biblical verse that said the aliens are going to come in the UFO somehow. Yeah. People were doing this. There's mass suicides that happen because of what I thought the religion said. That's why you have to follow traditional scholarship who took from, who took from, who took from, back to the source. And we hold that very dear within our tradition. Now, finally, I would like to say that even with all the Muslims have gone through in the Muslim world, at the hands of our uh, afflicting policies in the foreign uh, department, they still all wish they could come here because of the internal policies that will offer them so much. They all are all on a big waiting list to come here because they see that there is good, but they're living in a dichotomy. How do I balance this thing out? All of these things and then this. What do I do? Now those that did come here appreciate America very great. You did not see American Muslims flipping out at embassies and all of this. Why? Because we're educated. Our main, igno our main enemy here is ignorance. That is our fault. So we need to come together as a human race, as an American people, and work together to build a common respect and understanding, and especially build a platform on the service and spreading of mercy and compassion to mankind, because many people are hijacking government and religion and many different things for malicious purposes. And it's those people of sound reason and deep spirituality that are meant to bring sense to all of that, to bring a voice of reason for all of that. Thank you very much for this time. I'm honored to be your guest. I appreciate you allowing us the time to talk to you. I very much appreciate our speakers and um, thank you very much.